Here we have an uncompressed image, and it uses 46 megabytes of space. And over here, we have the same image as a compressed JPEG, and it uses 4.1 megabytes. Can you see the difference? What about when we zoom in so that we can see the individual pixels? Well, in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the JPEG algorithm and see how images can be compressed to just a tenth of their uncompressed file size, all while keeping the same image resolution and a very high quality appearance. To begin, let's take a quick 26 seconds to understand the importance of this algorithm, why we're making this video, and truthfully, why you should stick around. First, most digital images from your phone or a camera are saved using the JPEG format. Second, I spent a couple hours on the internet recording which images were JPEG versus other formats, and found that 86% of the images were JPEGs, so essentially this algorithm is everywhere. Third, video compression algorithms such as H.264 well, that's 26 seconds, so let's get back to seeing what JPEG does. In short, JPEG goes through and analyzes each section of an image and finds and removes elements that your eyes can't easily perceive. When you compress an image via JPEG, you can use a sliding scale called quality to decide how much you want to compress the image. As the quality of an image decreases from 100% to 0%, the amount of file compression increases, thereby decreasing the amount of space the image file takes up. Here we have 12 images, along with the quality and file size of each image. As we continue to compress the image, we can see that the picture's resolution, or number of pixels, stays the same. But eventually we get these defect squares, which are technically called artifacts. Let's take the 90% image, and the 10% image, and zoom in. Here we can see the inner workings of the JPEG compression hard at work. But wait, how exactly does JPEG work? Well, that's the focus of this video, so let's dive right in. The JPEG compression algorithm is composed of five key steps, each with a rather complicated name. But before we dive into the details, it's first important to understand the reason why JPEG works. Human eyes are not perfect. They have their nuances, and JPEG exploits these nuances to remove information that our eyes are not great at perceiving. For example, in the human eye there are two different types of light receptive cells rods, and cones. Rods are not color sensitive and are critical for seeing in low light conditions, whereas cones, with their color receptors of red, green, and blue, are color sensitive. Furthermore, in each eye, there are 100 million rod cells, whereas there are only 6 million cone cells, and as a result, your eyes are far more receptive to the brightness and darkness of an image which is called luminance, and far less receptive to the colors contained in that image, which is called chrominance. Take this image of some tulips, for example. The black and white version that shows only the luminance appears to be just as detailed as the full colored image. However, when we look at just the color alone, or the chrominance, that same image appears significantly less detailed. So let's see how the JPEG algorithm exploits the nuance of the human eye. The first step is color-space conversion. See, the original image is composed of pixels, and every pixel has a red, green, and blue component, each with a value from 0 to 255. And the combination of these three values of R, G, and B results in a color for a single pixel. The process of color-space conversion takes these three R, G, and B values for every single pixel and calculates three new values, luminance, blue chrominance, and red chrominance, abbreviated Y, CB, and CR. This process is reversible, and no data is removed during the conversion. However, the next step, called chrominance downsampling, removes a considerable amount of data. Remember how we said that our eyes are bad at detecting color or chrominance versus brightness or luminance? 
Well, in downsampling, we take both the blue and red chrominance component images and divide the component images into 2x2 two two blocks of pixels. Then we calculate the average value for each block, remove the repetitive information, and shrink the image so each average value of a 4 pixel block takes up a single pixel. As a result, the information that our eyes are poor at perceiving the red and blue chrominance component images are shrunk to one quarter of the original size, but the luminance remains the same. Now, with just two steps, the image is half the original size. Note that when reassembling the picture, the blue and red chrominance images are rescaled to match the size of the luminance component, with the RGB values being recalculated from luminance, blue chrominance, and red chrominance. And because the luminance changes from pixel to pixel, the recalculated RGB values can change from pixel to pixel as well. The next two steps are definitely a little more complicated, and they're called discrete cosine transform, or DCT, and quantization. Together, these two steps also remove information, but they do it by exploiting the fact that our eyes aren't good at perceiving high-frequency elements within images. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at this picture of the woods. Our eyes are great at seeing the edge of a tree or the outline of a rock. But when it comes to focusing on and distinguishing high-frequency color data, such as single blades of grass, individual leaves in a cluster of leaves, or variations in the shadows created by the leaves of a tree, our eyes can't really pick out the details. Furthermore, most nature or landscape photography has portions of the image that are out of focus, and removing high-frequency color variation to create smoother textures is unnoticeable. So then, how does the JPEG algorithm exploit the nuance of the human eye? Well, essentially, the discrete cosine transform and quantization steps go through each section of the image and find areas that have a high frequency of alternating chrominance or luminance. These elements that our eyes aren't able to perceive are then removed. This process is rather complicated, but bear with us. Let's use the luminance component image as our example. But know that the same process happens with the two chrominance components. The first step is to divide the entire image into 8x8 eight eight sections called blocks, each with 64 pixels with values from 0 to 255 that represent the luminance at every pixel. Next, we shift each value by subtracting 128 from each value, so the range becomes negative 128 to 127, where negative 128 is black, and 127 is white. The next step is complicated, so let's start with an analogy. Pretend you have a painting that you want to recreate, and you only have a dozen different colors. In order to recreate this painting, you'll need perhaps 15 parts of the first paint, and then 3 parts of the second paint, followed by 8 parts of the third paint, all the way up until you use perhaps 11 parts of the last paint. And in the end, we have recreated our original painting. The discrete cosine transform works kind of like this. However, instead of paint, we use these 64 base images. And just like in our analogy, we can rebuild any block of 64 pixels using a combination of these 64 base images, with each image multiplied by a value or a constant saying how much of that base image is used. Thus, the 64 pixel block each containing a value is transformed into 64 values, or constants, that represent how much of each base image is used. Let's take this letter A, for example. We can rebuild this letter A using this set of 64 base images with a constant multiplied by each base image. We add up all the base images times their respective constant, and as a result, we get this letter A. Nothing in DCT actually compresses or shrinks the image, but the next step, quantization, does. So, how does quantization work? Well, here we have our table of constants corresponding to the utilization of each base image. The next step is to divide each value in the table of constants by the corresponding value in the quantization table and round each result to the closest integer. 
This quantization table has higher numbers in the bottom right, where the high frequency data that your eyes aren't great at perceiving is located, and smaller numbers in the top left, where more distinct patterns are located. After we divide each constant by the corresponding value in the quantization table and round to the nearest integer, our block's data looks like this. It has just a few numbers and a lot of zeros. In this step, we're throwing away data, but really, we're just throwing away data that our eyes don't perceive. So we can't even tell the difference. We also use a second quantization table with the chrominance values that are larger, and thus we generate even more zeros in the resulting table. In essence, throughout the discrete cosine transform and quantization steps, the entire image uses a set of 64 base images, which are always the same, and two quantization tables, one for luminance and the other for chrominance, in order to transform every 8x8 block of pixels into just a few numbers and a whole bunch of zeros. The last step is called run length and Huffman encoding and in it we list all the values for every block in both the luminance and chrominance images. However, when we list the numbers, we use a zigzag pattern like this, because it's more likely that the non-zero numbers will be found up here. Next, we use a run length encoding algorithm, where we list the numbers, and then, instead of listing all the zeros, we just say how many zeros there are. Perhaps you can see that this list of just a couple dozen numbers is far more compressed than 64 pixels being represented each by a number from 0 to 255. After that, we use a Huffman encoding scheme, which is a whole separate encoding algorithm that's covered pretty well in this video by Tom Scott, that you should take a look at after we discuss the H.264 video compression algorithm and how the image is rebuilt as well as a few caveats. The H.264 video compression algorithm, also called Advanced Video Coding, or AVC, is currently the recommended video compression algorithm for uploading videos to YouTube, and it uses techniques such as chrominance downsampling or chroma subsampling, as well as variations of discrete cosine transform and quantization. However, H.264 is more complicated because instead of compressing a single static image as in JPEG, video compression must compress 24 to 60 or more frames for every second of video. The very short explanation is that it uses intraframes, or iframes, which are similar to JPEG images for one out of every 30 frames. And then, for the other 29 frames, it uses prediction or bidirectional prediction to only code for the difference and motion while using previously decoded frames as reference. Note that the frequency of iframes varies widely, and there is typically an iframe at the start of every scene change, as prediction doesn't work well across scene changes. These topics are incredibly complex, so they'll have to be covered in a separate video. But let's now get back to JPEG. In order to rebuild the original image, we follow the reverse set of steps. First, we disassemble the run length encoding and perform Huffman decoding schemes and lay the values into our 8x8 blocks. Next, we multiply each value by the quantization table and then multiply the resulting constants by the corresponding base images and add all the constituent base images together. Then, we upscale the red chrominance and blue chrominance images and reconvert the luminance and chrominance values into the red, green, and blue color space. With this, we can see how four blocks of luminance and two sets of chrominance blocks yield a 16 by 16 grid of pixels. Finally, when we zoom out, we have something that looks nearly identical to our original uncompressed image. It's truly amazing how your smartphone can take images composed of millions of pixels and then perform calculations on every 8x8 block of pixels, compressing all that data into just a couple dozen numbers, and then turning around and uncompressing the image faster than it takes you to swipe your finger across the screen. For example, this picture is 4,032 by 3,024 pixels, which yields a total of 190,512 blocks. And in order to compress or uncompress this image, 
every single block must go through each step of the algorithm. Indeed, our smartphones are truly impressive. But wait, wait, we're not yet done with this video. There are some additional notes and major shortcomings to the JPEG algorithm that we should discuss. First, sometimes you can select how much you want to compress an image, and this scaling level of compression changes the values in the quantization table. Because the algorithm divides using these quantization tables, and then rounds to the nearest result, if we increase the values in the table, we will inevitably get more zeros in the resulting discrete cosine transformed and quantized block. And as a result, the file will be smaller. However, with too much compression, you get artifacts, or issues with the compressed image that look like blurry splotches on the edges of square blocks. You can see how many blocks have similar traits to the top left blocks in the discrete cosine transformation table. The next note is that earlier we mentioned that quantization removes high frequency data, which is partially correct. In reality, quantization reduces the precision of an image block and reduces the precision more for the high frequency data compared to the low frequency data, thus making the image block less accurate. The third note is that JPEG is great at compressing pictures taken from a camera because natural world pictures tend to have a lot of smooth textures, and because no camera is perfectly in focus, it's hard to tell the difference between the uncompressed and compressed image. However, it doesn't perform well at compressing vector graphics like this. And in fact, you get rather noticeable artifacts close to the boundary lines in vector graphics. This is because the JPEG algorithm needs to reconstruct these straight lines using the base images, which don't work perfectly when the data is compressed. Therefore, it's recommended not to compress vector graphics using the JPEG algorithm. Finally, JPEG is by far the most common image format because it's old, well understood, and royalty free. But there are a number of other image formats, some with comparably better compression capabilities. Rather fittingly, this video is sponsored by Brilliant, a website and app that teaches you all kinds of STEM topics in hands-on, interactive ways. From the basics, such as foundational math or computer science fundamentals, all the way to complex topics such as astrophysics and quantum computing. In this video, we just scratched the surface of algorithms by showing you the inside of one algorithm. But if you want to learn more about the algorithms that run our technology-filled world, we recommend you look at Brilliant's course on Algorithm Fundamentals. Brilliant uses interactive courses to bring explanations, and thus your understanding, to the next level. Textbooks, boring lectures, and PowerPoint presentations are out, and fun animations and interactives are in. For the viewers of this channel, Brilliant is offering 20% off an annual subscription to the first 200 people to sign up. Just go to brilliant.org slash branch education and you can find that link in the description below. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. That's pretty much it for the JPEG compression. We believe the future will require a strong emphasis on engineering education, and we're thankful to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership sponsors for supporting this stream. If you want to support us on YouTube memberships or Patreon, you can find the links in the description. Also remember to subscribe, comment below, and share this video with others. This is Branch Education. Thanks for watching to the end.